Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Aggressive Intelligence. On this channel, we do many documentaries on black inventors and black business men and women who have had an impact on the world and our daily lives. These are the stories they don't teach you in school. A rich African-American landowner from Arkansas named Ottawa W. Gurley traveled across the country just before the turn of the 20th century to take part in the Oklahoma land run in 1889. The young businessman had just quit his job as a presidential appointee under President Grover Cleveland to start his own business. O.W. Gurley had a variety of positions during his life, including those of teacher, church founder, presidential appointee, general store owner, hotel owner, landlord, and deputy police officer. However, he is most known for creating the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The history of Tulsa and all of Oklahoma is closely entwined with the tale of O.W. Gurley. One of the most major events in Tulsa's history was the 1921 attack on Greenwood. After World War I, Tulsa gained fame across the country for the wealthy African-American neighborhood known as Greenwood District. This booming commercial corridor and the neighborhood it surrounded were dubbed Black Wall Street. A sequence of violence in June 1921 came close to destroying the whole Greenwood region. O.W. Gurley, formerly acknowledged as the richest person in Tulsa, Oklahoma, witnessed his assets burned down between May 31st and June 1st, 1921, during the Tulsa race riot. Black Tulsans suffered the majority of the estimated 300 fatalities and the millions of dollars lost due to damage of businesses and property, and black people were still held responsible for starting the riot. This is the story of O.W. Gurley, the man who started Black Wall Street. So sit back, relax, let's get into it. Ottawa W. Gurley was born on Christmas Day in 1868 in Huntsville, Alabama to John and Rosanna Gurley, both emancipated slaves. Eight years later, John and Rosanna moved their family to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, which included Ottawa and his three younger siblings. One of only two predominantly black cities in Arkansas, Pine Bluff allowed free slaves to develop a comfortable middle-class lifestyle. Some even attained positions of leadership in educational institutions and political authority. O.W. self-educated and attended public schools before working as a teacher and postal worker. On November 6, 1889, O.W. Gurley wed Emma Wells while residing in Pine Bluff. They didn't have any biological children during their marriage. O.W. traveled to Oklahoma Territory at a period when tens of thousands of black people did so because they considered the territory as prime location for the development of black cities. The 25-year-old businessman joined the Cherokee Outlet opening on September 16, 1893, running 50 miles before settling on a section of prairie grass. He made a claim as Emma stood next to him on a block of property in what would eventually become Perry, Oklahoma, one of many towns that was promoted to blacks in the new territory. The Cherokee Outlet Opening On September 16, 1893, more than 100,000 people rushed into the Cherokee Strip of Oklahoma to claim valuable property that had formerly belonged to Native Americans. Starting the greatest land rush in history, land-hungry pioneers on horses and in carriages hurried forward to stake their claim to the best acres as soon as a pistol shot was fired, starting the chaotic sprint for settlers to claim the land. Yes, people lined up like the start of a race. A gun was shot and people raced by horses and carriages to stake claim to land. In his lofty vision, O.W. saw Oklahoma as the beginning of a new life for black Americans 
decades after emancipation. He campaigned for county treasurer without victory, but was appointed principal of the town school, and he eventually established a prosperous general store that he maintained for 10 years. O.W. Gurley and his fellow homesteaders began hearing rumors of enormous oil deposits in the adjacent boom town of Tulsa around the turn of the century. Local Tulsans were becoming wealthy thanks to a gusher well known as the Ida Glen No. 1, the first discovery in the vast mid-continental oil field, which later made unknown wildcatters Harry Ford Sinclair and J. Paul Getty into oil barons. O.W. Gurley wanted in on the action. In 1905, he relocated roughly 80 miles to Tulsa, after selling his general store and the land in Perry. On the north side of Frisco Railroad tracks, he purchased a sizable 40-acre parcel of land. It was on a dirt road that would eventually become Greenwood Avenue. Gurley started his first business, a boarding house. He split his land into lots for homes and businesses. He then constructed a grocery store. The name Greenwood Avenue was given to this street in honor of a city in Mississippi. Migration of black people who were fleeing the persecution in Mississippi became quite popular in the region. They would seek safety in O.W.'s building since there was no racial discrimination in Greenwood Avenue. On the other hand, as Greenwood became more self-sufficient and catered to more affluential black people, it was eventually termed Black Wall Street. O.W. Gurley also gave black folks who wanted to create businesses of their own financial loans. The boarding house ultimately evolved into the Gurley Hotel and O.W. started other ventures to support it, such as textile, tapestry, and a furniture company that attracted attention from all over the world. O.W. Gurley had a tendency to meet needs when he noticed them. Working as a supplier for nearby businesses and opening up fresh companies to fund his ventures, O.W. flourished as the area around him expanded. In a city with a total population of 72,000 people, the black population in the territory he had acquired increased from 2,000 to over 9,000 between 1910 and 1920. Along with a sizable working class population, the black community had professionals like physicians, attorneys, and other professionals who provided a number of different services. Booker T. Washington, a teacher at Tuskegee Institute, soon gave Greenwood neighborhood the moniker Negro Wall Street. Greenwood, now known as Black Wall Street, was almost self-sufficient with Black-owned enterprises, many of which were initially funded by O.W. Gurley. These businesses ranged from brickyards and theaters to an airline that provided chartered flights. In addition to constructing the Gurley Hotel at 112 North Greenwood, O.W. also rented out space to smaller companies. His other buildings included a two-story structure at 119th North Greenwood that housed a black employment agency as well as the Masonic Lodge. Additionally, he contributed to the founding of Vernon AME Church. O.W. Gurley owned at least 100 of the 600 black-owned businesses in the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Whatever the neighborhood wanted, they could purchase it on their own blocks. Because of segregation, a lot of black people went to work on the white side of town before returning to Greenwood and spending their money there, boosting the Greenwood economy. You had the wealthy, middle class, and poor all living on the same block. And so many of those individuals who started out in the working class, because they lived there, would eventually go on to own their own business. Tulsa saw a major transformation over the first two decades of the 20th century, going from a burned frontier to a bustling city. As gusher after gusher was found, 
the city quickly rose to prominence as the world's oil capital. And O.W. Gurley's Greenwood District experienced a boom at the same time. It was calculated that every dollar spent in Greenwood circulated the black economy nearly 30 times as businesses thrived. Red Summer was a period in mid-1919 during which white supremacist terrorism and racial riots occurred in more than three dozen cities across the United States. Racial tension in Tulsa had been rising since the Red Summer of 1919, and they had finally erupted. On May 30th, 1921, Dick Rowland, a black teenager, was accused of sexually assaulting Sarah Page, a white woman. A white mob arose in response, determined to lynch Rowland, who was being detained at the county jailhouse. Sarah Page said that the elevator encounter was a miscommunication and that she did not want to file a police report. The next morning, Roland was supposed to be released from custody by a judge. Local white residents were enraged when an article of the incident appeared in the White Tulsa Tribune the following day. Roland was being held in jail in Tulsa when a large mob gathered around it. As rumors of a potential lynching spread throughout Greenwood, a group of armed black men marched to the jail to protect him. O.W. Gurley was also a sheriff's deputy assigned to patrol the black community. He attempted to mediate the situation as racial tensions arose. What many refer to as the Tulsa Massacre began as a physical altercation between a white man and a black man. One of the black men was told to hand over his pistol by a white man as they were leaving. The man objected. A fight broke out and the gun went off. The shot was discharged into the air, but the two groups started firing at one another right away. The group of black men eventually ran back into Greenwood after being overran by the white mob in front of the courthouse which by this point had grown to around 2,000 people. That night, May 31st, 1921, the large white mob launched a full-scale attack on Black Wall Street. According to eyewitnesses, about 5 a.m., kerosene bombs were reportedly being thrown from planes to destroy the houses and businesses. By the time the massacre came to a conclusion on the morning of June 2nd, 1921, around 300 black people had perished. Black Wall Street had been completely destroyed and O.W. Gurley had lost nearly $200,000 in wealth, about $3 million in today's calculations. On June 1st, 1921, the second day of the riot, O.W. Gurley and his wife were home at the hotel they owned when he noticed men in khaki clothes setting fire to many nearby properties, including his own. He and his wife gathered up the guests and left the burning hotel. A man was shot and killed close by as they fled. While they were sprinting away, Emma stumbled and fell, but she begged her husband to keep going for fear of what they would do to him. He ran to Dunbar School, hiding there until that building caught fire. O.W. Gurley was captured by members of the National Guard when they saw him crawling out of the cellar and brought him to McNulty Park, which was a baseball stadium at 10th Street and Elgin Avenue at the time. There he was reunited with Emma. The majority of the bodies after the massacre were never found. It is assumed that they were buried in mass graves that have never been found. The worst racial slaughter in American history never resulted in a criminal case or punishment of anyone. O.W. Gurley departed Greenwood for Los Angeles. O.W. and his wife Emma established a modest hotel while relocating to a four bedroom house in South Los Angeles. On August 6, 1935, O.W. Gurley, 67 years old, passed away in Los Angeles, California from a brain hemorrhage. 
Emma, his wife, died three years later in 1938. Hey, you watched to the very end. We appreciate it, guys. Thanks for watching another episode of Aggressive Intelligence. See you in the next one. Check, now we gon' weigh up